So where and when were you born? I was born in um, uh, Iraq and in Crete, in Greece, um, March 25, 1945. So I think you're an Aries. Do you identify with being an Aries? Yeah, I'm an Aries. <laughs> does, it, oh, yeah. does it suit you? Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> How so? Um, well, I would say leadership and moving forward and uh, looking for, um, you know, um, but, but of course, uh, I'm not just Aries, I think I'm, I carry all the parts of, uh, of Zodiac, but yes. Uh, right. Do you know your rising and your moon? Um, yeah, actually I am, now I'm in the uh, Jupiter cycle, uh, as it is, and um, I have a, a Vedic astrologer that works with me and uh, we go through that. So, yeah. Oh. I was born. Yeah, I was born at uh, ten thirty. Actually, I was born right before the twenty fifth. But uh, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> uh, Vedic yeah. astrology has. I'm a Gemini, but Vedic astrology has me as a Taurus, and I I feel like I'm much more a Gemini than a Taurus. I wonder what appeals to you about Vedic astrology. Well, because they they go into a little bit more details than um, than at least. Um, you may understand, excuse me, understand uh, regular astrology, if I can call it that way. Uh, yeah, so we can talk about that another time when uh, I have my notes in front of me. Okay. But yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, I'm interested in the, the Myers-Briggs, the Kiersey and Bates, and you're right. an EI, um, NJ, and right. that's, the group profile is EN... Um, F, J, or P, and right. only two people are sensing out of this whole group. So I, that seems to me very interesting that it's so heavily an intuitive group. I see. <laughs> right. Only uh, two people. Are, only two people are intuitive. You say? Yeah. Only no, no. Only two people are sensing in in the oh, sensing intuitive category. Oh, I see. Only two people are sensing. Yeah. Yeah. One of them is Charles Tart, and the other is John Ryan, oh, yeah. who's a Canadian physician who does very oh, okay. intuitive metaphysical kind of work with the chakras. So I'll I, I'll have to find out more about their scores. Um, what about your birth order? I'm asking because uh, one of the scientists told me about a book called Rebel Scientists that found that most of the Innovative scientists were later born, but I haven't found that. So I wonder what your birth order is. What do you mean by birth order? Uh, oh, in, you mean... in your in your group of siblings, where? Oh yeah, yeah. I was. I'm the third one. I'm the third one. I'm the last one. You're you're three of three. So yeah. um But there are more firstborns in this group, and maybe it's just that, uh, in terms of demography, there's more firstborns than laterborns. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, I'm I'm the I'm the youngest one in, the, in my siblings. Okay, and then yeah. you, what was it? How how much of your childhood did you spend in Crete, and then how did you get to the U.S.? I spent um, basically all my childhood in Crete. Um, um, before I came to the U.S., I had gone only to Athens, and then basically, 18 years old, I came to the United States. And then stayed after that. <laughs> so you came yeah. for university? Yeah, I came to go to Cornell, and then from Cornell I went to MIT. Uh, to MIT. And, and do you need to have your hand here because it's a little for the video? Oh. Maybe. It's oh, so yeah, so you're 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 doing video as well, right? Yeah. It'll go in the, here. Oh yeah. Can you hear me well. Yeah. Okay, great. It's very good. Yeah. So okay. what did you have a? Um, uh, a public school education in Crete, or how did you get such a good education that you could go to Cornell and MIT? No, I was actually uh, in private school. It was a, uh, that private school doesn't exist anymore. But basically, I owe a lot of it to my father. He was uh, he came to this country um, at the beginning of the of the 20th century and became an American citizen, and eventually went back to Greece. So. Uh, all of us, all three siblings, all 
uh, all boys, uh, uh, we grew up with uh, English, learning English from our father. I also uh, knew French. Um, French was actually my second language. And um, so then uh, basically my uh, middle brother, um, Fortis Carpal, is actually a well-known biologist. Uh, he passed away recently. Uh, he, he went to Cornell and uh, studied biology and then, then went to Harvard and became uh, the youngest uh, professor at Harvard mm. uh, in, in the 60s, mid 60s. So I pretty much follow, in a way, my father and my brother <laughs> steps. I got scholarship for scholarship from Cornell and um, I ended up uh, from Cornell, I went to MIT. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you're for a while in South Korea. What What are you doing there? Um, South Korea, I, have coll I collaborate with um, Korean scientists uh, in the area of uh, uh, climate change and natural hazards. Um, they are much bigger than we are um, in terms of government policies <laughs> in, uh, you know, being concerned about the environment, and we are in the States. Of course, California is a different uh, different situation. I think we're, we're happy to live in California. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a unique state for sure. Um, but in any case, so that's one thing that I do in terms of science. And the other thing is I actually give lectures and work with uh, groups, particularly youth, to promote uh, consciousness, the understanding that um, we, we are, in a way, we're in the universe. Uh, uh, the, we need to wake up to our true nature instead of uh, thinking ourselves as small, so to speak. And, and do you find that youth are more understanding of that concept? I know they, they're certainly being activists around the world today to stop climate change. Do, do, they, do they understand what you're saying about consciousness, do you think, more than older people? I, I think um, that certainly in Korea, uh, younger people are more open than uh, older people. I find also older one fancies relative. I mean, young in mind, and of course you can be quite old to be young in mind. Uh, I consider myself being young in mind, even though I, you know I have a biological age. Um, so yeah, I would say that young people are looking, are seekers. They're the same. Uh, in Korea, the same in Greece. After Korea, I'm going to Greece, and same uh, same reaction. People are really very thirsty. They're looking for a new paradigm. They know that the old paradigm is not working. Uh, this separation and division does not work. And young people are concerned about their future. And I have I myself have three uh, three sons, so I'm concerned about their future too. And, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, what's interesting to me is that people talk about a new paradigm of non-materialist consciousness, but Greeks, you know, 500 years before the Christian era were talking about idealism, and Plato talked about the form that's behind the material manifestation. So in a way, it's, it's a very old paradigm. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right, and of course I also... Uh, study the Vedas and uh, you know Shaivism, you know the, uh, some of the great monistic schools of uh, of India. Uh, we interact quite a bit with Zen Buddhists here in Korea. They have a very strong. Uh, and also, I I, I talk with um, uh, Christian uh, fathers and uh, priests. So talk in a dialogue, and we have very good discussions. So I think it's a universal message. So you're absolutely right. The the it's it's the new old, <laughs> it's ancient paradigm, but we forgot it, and uh, because of materials, and so now we're rediscovering. So in a way, we call I call it new because uh, an important component that comes in now is the is the role of quantum mechanics and the role of uh, science, and that of course didn't exist in back in the past, even though. Some of the ancient Greek philosophers, um, for example, Heraclitus or Heraclitus, as he's called in Greek, um, in a way, I believe he was uh, the first quantum uh, philosopher because he, he said some things about uh, the nature of reality that were um, very uh, on target. And of course, Plato and uh, Socrates and uh, the Ionian philosophers. So definitely, there is a rich tradition in the West, and the Greek philosophers to the Neoplatonists, 
and then the mystical Christian Christianity. And of course, from this we have the non uh, non dual schools of uh, Advaita Vedanta and uh, uh, Triadic or Trika Shaivism in India, um, which are very sublime systems, the ancient Vedas. And uh, then we have Taoism in. Um, and um, I would say Buddhism, particularly the uh, Zen Buddhist uh, variety. So, what is the message of all these different traditions? So, it's the same message. The message it does not change. It's just that it comes with different traditions, different teachers, different language, different cultures. But the basic message is that we are more than we think we are. <laughs> so, and I think now quantum mechanics can actually give us um, the tools to understand scientifically. We'll, we'll get into more specifics about that, but would you say that since Descartes, the West separated materialism and spirituality, and so, the, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then quantum physics is now turning it around. Okay, before we get into that, um, what was your family's attitude towards um, religion and spirituality? How were, were you raised in a church tradition? Yeah, I was raised in church tradition. Uh, my mother was very religious, as I think I indicated in, in the uh, question earlier you sent. Um, and my father was uh, spiritual. I, I distinguish the two because uh, uh, religion perhaps is a little bit more formal, in, you know, um, going to service, etc., etc., where spirituality, I think, is uh, more universal. So, uh, but in the end, they were, in a way, they were both spiritual. So I was raised. Um, in a spiritual background, um, but then um, around 14 years old, I told my father I want to study science. Um, uh, I actually started as an artist because I was born uh, uh, with the gift of drawing and painting, so I, it was easy for me. And the plans uh, early on were for me to go to Paris and study fine arts. And uh, 14, 14 years old, I told my father, this is too easy for me. I can do this. So <laughs> my eyes closed. I want to do something challenging. So he said, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to study science. And he said, well, in that case, you have to go to America. So he didn't, you know, he didn't flinch on, you know, immediately he said, you have my blessings. <laughs> if that's what you would do, and you have to go to America. You cannot go to Europe. You have to go to America. He was right, of course. Mm. And so um, I followed pretty much the footsteps. So. What What was the biggest culture shock when you went to Cornell at age 18? What was the hardest part of adapting to American culture? Um, not much of a culture shock because when you're 18 years old, you're very open. I was inside very often. I can tell you my biggest shock was when Kennedy was assassinated because um, I was... I arrived in the States uh, in June 1963, and then, of course, uh, Kennedy was uh, shot in uh, November, of, uh, I think it was November 22nd, 1963. So that was a big shock, and uh, we were all shocked. All our, my classmates at Cornell we were all shocked because, of course, it was, uh, um, it was an ideal situation with uh, President Kennedy and the way he was uh, killed. And, of course, uh, you know, then what happened between uh, 63 and 68 with the uh, Vietnam War, and, uh, and then Martin Luther King being shot, and then uh, Bobby Kennedy being shot. So those were really the things I, I have never got used to, the violence, uh, particularly gun violence that is taking place in America. Then it continues, yeah. Yes. Um, do you... Find, do you have a meditation practice? A lot of people that I've interviewed find that, that, that having a, a particular practice of meditation has helps them stay centered. Yes, I, I meditate. Um, I try to meditate every, every, every morning or particularly in the morning. And uh, it's mostly using um, a mantra and um, uh, also following the breath. But yeah. So, for example, you uh, can use the mantra Om Namah Shivaya, which is a universal mantra, or um, uh, follow the breath and, uh, you know, the so-called, the sound of the, of the breath, which is uh, Soham or Hamsa, you know, the, which, of course, has a meaning in, uh, in uh, Sanskrit. 
Mm. Um, what what have been the most difficult challenges in your life, and and how were you able to get through them? I'm asking that because I think it's useful for people, because we all have challenges to know how other people cope. Well, um, certainly one of my biggest challenges was uh, my divorce uh, with uh, my ex, and um, that's it's never <laughs> it's never an easy thing and. Uh, I think I, I become wiser because of the whole process. So that's on the personal level. At the, at the professional level was, um, I would say, I could always see uh, beyond horizon. I could see in, into the future. I could see into the, into the things that I develop. And I, was, I have been a dean at two different universities for 10 years. So um, it was... Um, hard sometimes to convince my other fellow professors that there's more than what they do, what they teach, what we all teach. Uh, but I think in terms of being an innovative dean, um, I was an, an innovative dean and uh, I had, uh, I was working with uh, good administrators at the president and provost level. So that was, that was good because uh, at least I had the backing of uh, the administration at the two universities at George Mason University and also at uh, Chapman University where I presently am. Um, so the, uh, if, you are, if you're going against administration, it's not easy at all. But so being a dean and having the backing of the president and the, the provost um, and fellow deans was actually good. But sometimes it's hard to convince my fellow, you know, wearing my hat as a faculty member to convince my fellow faculty that, hey, we've got to be open in academia. You know, can be too narrow minded in academia. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And then you're you're married now to another professor. So did you learn from yes. your first marriage in a way that helped the second? <laughs> yes, as, as the famous line <laughs> says in the Indiana Jones, <laughs> you chose <laughs> wisely. I chose wisely the second time. <laughs> well, we have to go through these different experiences to expand and grow and be challenged. So. So I'm married to a Korean woman, a lady, and she's a neuroscientist, and um, she's uh, very active, and I would say um, um, a modern, a modern person that uh, combines uh, science and uh, she's a little bit more practical uh, than I am. <laughs> Women many times tend to be more practical, but um, certainly she's uh, very open-minded, and she's uh, she does communication on neuroscience. Uh, is our field. Mm -hmm. um, what, what about people report that once they commit to kind of a spiritual path that synchronicities speed up and that there's more and more of these kind of unexplained uh, answers to what we need at the moment? Have, have you experienced that with synchronicity? I know you write about it. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Um, what came up last year um, in Korea, uh, talking to young people again, we had a group of young people we were talking, and then um, I started saying some things, and I knew that were not really coming from me. Um, and so what came out is um, eight, um, uh, what I call it, eight uh, uh, ways or eight rules, not rules in a, in a you know, in an open way, not rules in a, that you but, have to do something. But principles? Principles, yeah, principles, laws of university life, or, which apply to everyday life. And um, the first one is um, expect the unexpected, which is very much quantum. You know, we human beings expect the expected, but actually, most of the time, it's the unexpected. And synchronicity works through the unexpected. Mm. But then you go back and look and say, well, actually, that was not random. There was a purpose behind it all. And um, as you, by the time you get to the, to the fifth level, or the, the fifth, uh, or the fifth, not fifth level, but fifth uh, um, principle. principle, that's general principle from the way, which are very, very everyday life. What happens is that if you have paid attention to little things, in, the second one is pay attention to little things in your life. Look at the li little miracles in your life. Not, don't expect bigger miracles to go, little miracles in your life. And you go through these um, five steps, 
then lo and behold, things start moving very fast. And um, then what happens, in fact, is that you can do much more now. Time has expanded, so you can fit in more in a given time period if you go by clock, by, by universal clock. <laughs> but you find out that the subjective time is changing. And of course, um, we know that time has two, two different, there are two types of time. There are, uh, cosmic time or time that is covered by clocks, and then uh, uh, process time that is really the subjective uh, time that we live by. So you find that your subjective time expands and you can do a lot more, and then you find these little miracles taking place every step of the way. So it is, in a, in a sense, as if we are being guided. The question is, who is guiding us? And the answer, I think, is the universe. <laughs> And does that mean God? Does that mean a universal intelligence? Does that mean personal guides? Who, 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 what, what is the universe? All, all, all of the above, all of the above. The, I think there's only unity, there's only unity awareness, there's only one consciousness in the universe, and we're a part of it. Um, generally, I, I don't particularly talk too much about God because um, that is more of a personal path. People usually get all kinds of excited when they start talking about God. So I prefer to call it universal consciousness, but of course it's the same idea. Yeah, I think universal consciousness, it, it gets us away from the idea of God as a man with a beard and exactly. sitting on a yeah. chair and that kind of anthropomorphic view yeah. of, of God. In fact, which... uh, in fact um, you know, following some of the Hindu traditions, um, it turns out that the creative 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 so universe is actually Shakti, who is the feminine aspect. It's not it's not a male. Shiva is the is the male aspect, but Shakti creates the universe. So, and of course, if you take it to all the way, it is women who create life. <laughs> so we have to put things back in perspective. It's yeah. Native Americans have corn mother, buffalo cow woman, or whoever. So. Yeah, I think the West is kind of unique in being so uh, patriarchal and male-centered in its view of divinity. Catholics have Mary, but that's about it in right. the West. Right, so the Catholics and the Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, um, or the Eastern Orthodox, so to speak, uh, Mother Mary is, uh, is much stronger than in Protestant traditions. Uh, and so at least the feminine still... <laughs> It's still, in fact, in the Orthodox Church, it says pretty much that um, you pray to Mother Mary to inter to intercede with uh, Jesus. Yeah, so, but being an inter intercessor is not the same as being the one with no. the power. <laughs> Go ask yeah. your mom if your if your dad will give you the car keys. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So it's actually funny because uh, speaking about that, because of course my father grew up in a village in uh, in Crete. And uh, the the father, the father, or the, my grandfather, of course, his father was the male uh, patriarchal figure. But my father would joke, he'd say at night, because there was a big family, they would sleep, they were all in, in a small, you know, in village. They would all sleep and listen to the, to the, uh, their, their mother and their father. And he said, at night, when the kids were asleep, you could tell who the boss was. <laughs> It was my grandmother. <laughs> so she would tell him, she would tell him, what are you doing? What, why are you doing this and this? <laughs> there's, I think there's a Greek saying that the man is the head, but the woman is the neck. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's from, from the, my big fat the Greek way. <laughs> but is that a real Greek saying, or is that just a movie thing? I think it's a movie thing, but okay. yeah, I actually had not heard about it until the movie. But yeah, in a way, it makes sense. <laughs> okay. Um, I, as a footnote, I want to say that I put together a book for young, new college students called Your Mindful Guide to Academic Success, Prevent Burnout. And it's, I, I, I was inspired to write it when I was in South Korea because the kids that I talk with in high schools were complaining that they would be up till, they would be at school till 10 o'clock at night studying for the college exam. And so they were stressed. So they would just sleep on the weekends. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. So I, 
I just want you to know about that book. And then I've also been writing a series of books about global youth activism and oh, what's on the mind yeah. of young people. And one of the books is called Ageism and Youth Studies because I found that the people who wrote about youth didn't even talk to them. No, I, that is, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the gap of, uh, of a senior who thinks and knows everything. So I, I listen to the youth and say, I want to learn from you. Uh, and uh, so we have a lot of good discussions. And uh, generally, when I, I, I talk into public, big public forums, I talk to everybody, but I say I'm particularly addressing my comments to the youth because you're the future. And uh, who you all find are going to be gone <laughs> sooner or later, but you know, it's you who are going to carry forward. Right. Okay, let's, let's get into your, um, your books and your, the concepts that you've developed. Um, let's start with a really easy question. What, what is the hard problem of consciousness? <laughs> so the, the, I, the hard problem of consciousness, I, I consider it the easy problem of consciousness. Really? <laughs> the hard problem of consciousness is where the consciousness come from. And if you try to build it from bottom up, it's... Uh, not only it's a hard problem, but it's an impossible problem. So I, I take it the other around, and of course this comes from the mystical traditions of both East and the West, from Plato and, uh, and uh, Socrates, of course, and uh, Heraclitus in the West, and the Neoplatonists, and then of course from the East, the Vedas, um, Advaita Vedanta, and um, Zen Buddhism, and uh, Triadic, uh, triadic, uh, or uh, triadic system. Um, if, the uni if the universe is consciousness, is nature, then it's an easy problem. And otherwise, it's an impossible problem. So I have reached the conclusion that the science of the future will accept um, consciousness as, as primary. And that is easy. It's all driven from universal consciousness. You can't, uh, so um, I give an example of, I like the Notre Dame de Paris, because, you know, French was my second language, and uh, I love Paris. So, of course, there was a big accident there recently. But um, the way I described uh, Notre Dame, it did, it, one day, it did some bunch of people, and architects got together and said, okay, here is some water, here is some uh, uh, iron, here is some glass, here is some painting. Let's create this great cathedral from scratch. That's not how it happened. It never happens that way. It, you have a blueprint, you have an idea. So it goes from the idea, then you implement it. The pyramids, the great pyramids, the same way. The Parthenon. The Parthenon was not built by random things. If you look at the architecture of Parthenon, it, um, it uses the golden mean, it uses principles, mathematics, you know. Uh, so it's a great plan. So it, from the point of view of the great plan, it's the easy problem. From the point of view of trying to create the conscious awareness from the bottom up, it's impossible. That's the hard problem. Um, what are some other words for consciousness? People use awareness, memory. What what are what are synonyms for consciousness? So um, I, I like actually recently I like the word um, awareness. Because um, that's what we're really talking about. And whenever, in the English language, unfortunately, you only have a couple of words. You have consciousness, awareness, self-awareness. But basically, we have three or four. And I always joke and say, because I study a little bit of Sanskrit terms, in, in, the, in the Sanskrit language, there's at least 20 or 30 <laughs> different names for Shakti. It's usually the feminine aspect, right? Chitti, Shakti, um, you know, etc., etc. So, and each one of these, um, uh, Smatantriya, is another name, and uh, which means absolute freedom of uh, the universe. All these different names of the goddess are different aspects of the goddess. But in the West, we call it consciousness. And usually, when we say consciousness in the West, we mean being aware of, being conscious of something else. But so I, I prefer the term awareness because that is the underlying part of self consciousness as well as object consciousness or awareness. So I think the word awareness is more general. What if, if there's a single cell um, 
animal, I guess you'd call it, it it's aware that, oh, this is too hot or this is too cold. Right. Or, so this, this consciousness, where rocks don't have consciousness, do trees have consciousness? Where, where does it end? Uh, once you go down that path, even the rocks have consciousness, um, minerals have consciousness, but not human consciousness. Not it's a, it's a sort of a, um, I won't call it primitive, but it is not changing very much because the the elements are still there. I mean, the the chemical elements that form a rock are also in our bones, in our bodies. So what makes the difference between a rock and ourselves? Well, it's of course in the case of humans, it's the self awareness. That's the big difference. Uh, whereas a, a rock probably is not self-aware. But if you take universal awareness as taken in forms, then rocks are part of the picture, and humans are part of the picture, and whales, and dolphins, and babies are part of the picture. So it doesn't really end with, uh, uh, with uh, a life or living species. The big question I think in Kevin science is, where do you transition from living to non-living? And I, that's an open question. In fact, in the, in the book with Deepak Chopra, we say that's, that's still an open question. Is, is, of course, an amoeba is, is a living cell. We know that. Single cells are living. Is DNA living or not living? <laughs> you know, without DNA, you couldn't have a, you know, genetic code. So is DNA living or not living? And um, so I think the transition is not as sharp as Sometimes I think it is. Because DNA is, is alive. I mean, it, it changes. Exactly. It, it, exactly. It, it changes form, but it can't exist on its own outside of ourselves. Exactly. It cannot exist on its own. And I would say that human beings cannot exist on their own either. <laughs> We're part of the big picture. And one of the big problems now we have in terms of climate change is to consider ourselves, and this is a, a Western viewpoint go amok or go crazy. We, we believe in the idea that we are controlling of, of the universe and modern nature. Have dominion. Uh, have dominion, which is uh, uh, not a good concept to have. You know, I think the Native Americans have uh, way better, and in Eastern schools have way better attitude towards nature than we do. Right. They worked with it, not dominated it. Um, Okay, so with quantum mechanics, it's very tempting to say, oh, okay, because of this electron and this electron become entangled when we take this one and send it away and change its spin, this one instantaneously changes spin, so it means there's some kind of information field, and that could explain why we can do prayer from a distance or telepathy or precognition, but physicists, like you say, no, 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 you really can't make that, you, you can't with any validity say that that explains psi phenomena. So I would say that criticism is, um, is actually valid to a certain extent, and we have to be careful when we make uh, statements, scientific statements, to not go overboard. And in all my writings, I I point that out that this is where science goes and this is where it stops. Um, but of course, as human beings, who can be artists, who can be musicians, who can be you know, philosophers, uh, doesn't really prevent us from being scientists because we're also philosophers. But to make a long story short, um, there are meta laws, there are laws beyond the laws. And I call these universal laws, and there are three, basically three of them. That's, you remember we talked about the triadic. Uh, by the way, uh, the number three is the name of goddess, or is the number of goddess um, in the Hindu tradition. So, if you the triadic uh, nature of consciousness is is in fact how consciousness manifests. But the three laws are really com are more particularly um, obvious in quantum mechanics, the, and and so I call them um, quantum like. Okay. So quantum-like uh, encompasses quantum at the nano level, but it goes to uh, large dimensions. Uh, today we know that, uh, for example, the sensory system of a human being, you know, the eyesight, the the smell, it's a they are quantum. Our senses are quantum. How so? 
we can, there are Buddhist monks um, who can detect single photons. With training, you can see a single particle of light. This is a quantum phenomenon. Would they optically, they can see a photon? Yeah, they, yeah, they can see a single photon. Which wow. Is um, the way, for example, also the, the smell, we have a, a huge number, I don't know how many different, you can tell different kinds of smells. So this can only be explained in terms of quantum phenomena. I think in the brain you have quantum processes. For sure we know at some level it becomes quantum. So the question is, um, is it, when we say the particles disappear, you know, go in two opposite directions are connected, is that a, uh, can I like explain psi phenomena? The answer is no, because we're referring to individual particles. However, in terms of these metal laws, or in terms of this quantum light, the answer is yes, because of complementarity. So complementarity is a foundation principle in quantum physics uh, of Niels Bohr. And he actually, um, to his credit, he said it doesn't really apply just at the nano level. It applies at biological systems. So we, I worked with biologists, my brother was a biologist, um, to look at this interaction or marriage, if you like, in new science between biology and physics. We have to go that way because uh, one is more towards the inert, physics, uh, particles that you can say they are not living, whereas, whereas biology is, is a science of living. But again, it's not a sharp boundary. So we have to have, so the, the boundary comes through these three laws. So there are three of them, and they're in foundation of the universe. And the three laws are that of complementary, which mean is that a different word for entanglement? No, well, actually, you can those three laws. By the way, you can replace them. You can uh, you can instead of uh, complementarity, you can actually use entanglement. You can do that. Uh, it's just easier. I found out that these three laws are easier to express and to be understood by a large number of people. So I prefer those because, after all, science has to reach the people. And the time makes it a little bit difficult for people to understand. Unless you talk about the mother and child relationship, then people understand what the time means because a mother and a child are always entangled. <laughs> the mother never stops being entangled with the child, right? Um, a little bit actually more obvious in the case of the mother than the father. I think there's also entangled with the father, but in the case of the mother, it's um, because she has to carry the child for nine months. Or, so it's whatever. There is an even stronger bond that you would find between. Uh, so what are the three laws? So the first one is complementarity. The second one is universality. Uh, universality means um, allows um, uh, knowledge to uh, arise. If we didn't have universality, uh, we could not talk to each other. We could not understand each other. What is behind the universality is that um, the reality that applies to you also applies to me. Uh, the reality, and we know a lot from science. We, we don't say there's physics here and there's the physics in Alpha Centauri and they're different. We assume the physics is the same. So, uh, scientists, we take for granted the second law, which is the, uh, the law of universality. Or if we can find patterns, we can find similar patterns. For example, the spiral pattern is a dominant pattern in the universe. It exists in spiral galaxies, it exists in um, in our community spiral, it exists uh, as we know in modern dynamics and mathematics. Uh, it exists in plants. Look at the plants; they are they have these wonderful spiral patterns. So these are patterns that are not identical, but they are similar patterns. So that's the second law. The third law is interactivity. Everything in, in the universe interacts with something else. Even consciousness interacts with itself. Even when you're self-conscious or self-aware, you interact with yourself. So even a single person interacts with himself or herself. So these are three laws. I find them they are the, the most fundamental. And they they apply not just to quantum physics, they also apply to classical physics, but they're particularly obvious in quantum physics. And so this is where the term quantum light comes from. Um, it, it, there's been this struggle to try to unify the the physics of the big world and the physics of the subatomic world, the unified field theory, but no one's come close. Do you do you think that these three laws, in a way, bridge? Are, I, think are it, kind of, 
I think the three laws bridge, and I think the reason that that uh, we have not been able to unify, actually, it's actually a paper I wrote, you know, peer review paper I wrote with Subhash Kak, who is, uh, uh, you know, a very good thinker of does it, the Eastern tradition, but he's also a computer scientist, so he's very much a um, you know, Western scientist. Uh, and we wrote a paper where he said that basically um, there are not, there's not going to be unification between cosmological and uh, nano, the atomic levels, until we bring the questions into the picture. I think the reason that this has not gone anywhere is because we live out of time. We live out the big elephant in Europe, big white elephant in Europe. <laughs> So I think this uh, this uh, search will be futile until we realize that questions is primary. Well, why do you think that um, scientists, academics, are so afraid of consciousness, spiritual, what they call woo woo? Why there's, you know, like Wikipedia makes a point of saying someone like Dean Radin does pseudoscience. I mean, that's kind of typical of this approach that that's nasty and why why is it so emotional? Yeah, this is actually a great, great question. Um, it's emotional and people start uh, religious wars over <laughs> <laughs> <or> ideas. <laughs> and in a sense, uh, a lot of the so-called scientists um, are re religious zealots. They, they're as, as, as zealots as the old zealots uh, that they were, they were burning witches because, you know, they, they, they were afraid of the feminine aspects, so to speak. Um, so, I, in my experience, uh, because I talk to a lot of scientists, there's a lot of more of us out there than we see. Really? <laughs> there's, oh, yeah, a lot of us. It's just that uh, particularly young people, Young scientists um, um, are concerned because um, you you don't get tenure if you start to doing woo woo with science, so to speak. And in my case, um, I was actually also careful <laughs> before I got tenure at George Mason to not cross that line. Although I was teaching a course at um, George Mason University, um, where I was actually using meditation to study as a, as a first step to then study physics, and it, the results were great, and the students loved it. So there's a lot more than meets the eye, but general scientists, we, we are careful because of all this nastiness, as, as, you, as you call it. In fact, nobody, nobody wants to fight on a nasty level. In, in fact, in groups where I belong, various groups where I belong, if it starts getting nasty, I don't, I don't reply. It. You know, I don't, I don't reply to people who are nasty to me. I just, I just ignore it completely. Because once you get into this, in the game, because the third law <laughs> of interactivity, once you start with the third law in terms of interacting at the same level with nastiness, then then you have religious wars. <laughs> right. When you were getting your PhD in physics at MIT, what would you say the religious dogma was in terms of parapsychology or psi phenomena? Did they even talk about it? Not much in those days. Um, I was uh, in, a, in a prime physics department and I, I had the, I had the uh, privilege and pleasure to be with top physicists in the world. My advisor was uh, top physicist Philip Morrison. And, um, but then, so we were actually interested in, um, in questions about cosmology and quantum, how do you bring the two together? So that, that was challenging in order to do work. Um, so that, that, there was a lot of good physics that was taking place at MIT, and it's still, it's still taking place at MIT, it's not, it's not changed. That um, as, a, as a graduate student, I was immersed in that. So that attracted a lot of my attention. Um, but then later on, of course, um, you know, when I got more into meditation and looking at uh, philosophy as a foundation, uh, of everything, because in fact, coming from the, from the Greek tradition, uh, I think philosophy is the foundation of science. Mm. And not the other way around. Mm. As, an, as a kind of a footnote, was it humbling in a way to be at MIT with all these really, really bright people? Because before you probably were the brightest, and then at MIT I'm thinking, 
Everybody's bright. Everybody's bright. And actually, that was great because I said, well, actually, you're not alone here. You know, there are a lot of us. And we had joint seminars with Harvard, with Harvard Physics uh, Department. And um, uh, the, grad, the graduate students would talk to each other. So it didn't really matter whether it was Harvard or MIT. Um, there was one thing that mattered was the assistantship, how much money was uh, were getting as assistant, uh, graduate assistants. And it turns out my graduate assistants were getting more than Harvard. And the Harvard uh, kids were complaining, said, why are we getting less money? So they went to their faculty members and said, uh, and their department said, how come these MIT guys get more money? It was actually like 20 or 30 percent more, which was quite a bit. And uh, the answer they got was, well, we are Harvard and they are MIT. Well, well, I'm sorry about that. MIT is not a slow <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm assuming that literally most were guys, right? When you when you were in PhD program. Most were guys, yes, most were guys. Yeah, that's it's, not true anymore. Um, when I went to George Mason and became um, a professor at uh, in the physical department there, the majority of the physicists were women, <laughs> which was actually good. Uh, yeah, yeah, things uh, things had changed within a few years. Mm. But I think it's still true that um, that most of the the engineering, physics, computer science graduate students are men, even today. Yes, engineers. Yes, oh, but uh, and uh, and uh, women tend to go more into the biology. And but now in neuroscience, you you have, I would say, equally divided. It's fifty fifty, as far as I know. I don't think there's any. So these so-called salt sciences, or the life sciences, or the biological, or you know, the health things, they tend to be at least 50-50 if not dominated by women. Mm. So, you know, again, complementarity, the living and non-living, you know, perhaps one is more the male aspect, uh, the other is more the female aspect. But um, as I said, in some of the physics departments, like uh, University, in fact, University of Maryland and, and George Mason University, which I, there were a lot of uh, female uh, professors. Do you do you think that there's any gender differences in approaching the study of consciousness and the metaphysical? I mean, are women a little more inclined to be open to it or, or not? Because they have to really prove that they're one of the guys in academia. In fact, in fact um, some of the pushback I got at George Mason was from um, female professors, <laughs> uh, not so much from male professors, but female professors who would say, no, 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 this is not, you know, we're physicists and all of that. So part of it is what you're saying, but things are changing very rapidly. For example, my, uh, Susan Yang, you know, uh, my wife, she's a female professor and, um, um, you know, she teaches uh, neuroscience, you know, so um, I would say that um, as far as um, scientific uh, acuity, and uh, uh, women are um, at least as good as men. I say at least as good because my experience is actually that uh, women are a little bit smarter than men. It's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because they know they have to try harder. They have less ego that blinds them to, I've got to really work at this. I think, I think that may be part of the reason. But actually, you know, speaking of the Korean society, and some of the, you know, what I see here. Um, and I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned now because I see that men are, are falling behind uh, women in a big way. And, and we, we really should have balance between the two, not uh, have one. We it, don't it, want to go the other way. We don't want to go the other, other way. So they're to falling behind in terms of university attendance? Exactly. They don't do as well in the universities. They, they drop out. Uh, Women uh, students tend to do better in scores. And, uh, they tend to stick it out, and, and be, so eventually we may end up having most departments uh, having female professors and not many male professors. So that well, that would be interesting. around the world. Go. There's more women in university, except in Africa, but there's more university that, students women. That, yeah, exactly. It's, it's happening in big numbers, and I, I see that and. Uh, and here in Korea, uh, I, would, I can tell you that, uh, as, as, in, as well as in Greece, where you know, there are two cultures uh, used to, it is the, the female students that are the ones that are moving rapidly. And male students are trying to catch up. 
that was not the case when I was going to MIT, but uh, certainly within you know, 20, 30, 40 years, we, we're now seeing a big change. I, I think part of it is the women's movement said to women, you could have it all, but it also, the subtext was, but you've got to be good looking, you've got to be, may have a good academic record, you've got to have a good profession, you've got to be good in everything. So w women didn't take for granted that, that things came to them. They, had to, they knew they had to work. And I can fully sympathize with that because, and I can empathize or sympathize, because being myself from a foreign co culture, Greek, uh, English was not my first language, even though we knew a lot of English in, in our household. I had to work very hard. And what I achieved in my life, I would say, and I tell that to young people, I said, don't talk about brains. We're all more or less equal in brain power. Talk about hard work. If you want to advance, it is hard work. And women know that. From childbirth all the way to, <laughs> through life, right? Women know hard work is what gives us all. And men are falling behind because perhaps um, um, our society gives too much to young men. And so they become a little bit lazy, I would say. I mean, I can say that because I'm a man, so <laughs> nobody's going to accuse me of being an anti-male. But, um, you know, it is a concern that I have for the young, young men and young boys that... Um, and also, you know, you, you have a lot of... Uh, now in Korean society, in Japanese society, you have a lot of uh, suicides that, and then they tend to be primarily among the boys. Yeah, I think that's always been true in, in the States as well, that um, boys commit suicide more because they use weapons, whereas girls might use pills and be resuscitated. But I, but I read that the suicide rate for youth is rising in the U.S. because of all these pressures, I guess. Exactly. Okay, mm. um, okay so let's, let's look at your books and kind of see what, what the key... Um, thoughts were. It, Looking in, seeing out, Consciousness and Cosmos, published in 1991. Was was that your first book in terms of the these kind of metaphysical books? Right. It was my first book in terms of um, uh, metaphysical books. Um, we we're making the, uh, I was called, it was, I was called, uh, of course, that book uh, with my uh, uh, first wife. And uh, what we said in that book was that science and spirituality don't have to be opposite. And in fact, we made a, we made a point, which I'm still making, is that um, it was, as you said before, it was uh, Descartes. The vision came through Descartes, the Cartesian, and the mathematical universe, the clockwork universe, all worked so well. But um, Newton himself was a mystic, was a great mystic. <laughs> um, so when we say Newtonian physics, uh, Newton would not be a Newtonian. <laughs> he would be more of a natural philosopher, in fact, a common sense natural. So the break came with the Age of Enlightenment and the French Revolution. This is what happened. With Laplace and you know, the great um, advance of mathematical uh, physics, um, you know, the, the motion of the planets, etc., etc., which we now know is only an approximation. We know that's not the case. We have nonlinear dynamics. So we know that even in classical universe, um, that Cartesian universe doesn't really exist. But it became a division, and it was only until the, um, the first part of the 20th, 20th century that the quantum physicists put things back together again, mostly in Europe. Hmm. So Dr. Karatu was your first wife? Sorry? D your first wife was Dr. Karatu, the, the no, co-op? No. The co-author? Yeah. You like women uh -huh. with, with PhDs. I like women with PhDs. <laughs> it's more challenging. It's more challenging. <laughs> they, they, keep me, they keep me thinking. <laughs> right. That makes perfect sense. All right. And then in the, um, the, you and your first wife and Robert Nadeau wrote the, the non-local universe, the new physics and matters of the mind in 2001. And in there you talk about experiments in terms of, um, of entangled non-local photons. Tell us about that. So that was a book with Robert Nadeau, who was actually 
an English professor at uh, George Mason. And by the way, he also took a lot of flag from his department because they're saying, why are you talking to scientists? You're an English, prof <laughs> you're an English professor. <laughs> I can read it. You got your little box. You can't get out of your little box. Yeah, exactly. Academia is full of these boxes. You can get out of the box. But he actually was an expert on Niels Bohr, and that's how I got into Bohr and uh, visited, visited the Copenhagen uh, uh, School of Bohr. And um, so, yeah, yeah, that was the Conscious Universe uh, was uh, written by Robert Nadeau, and then the non local Universe. Um, and then it was published several times. So the last time was, um, in fact, uh, the latest edition, I think, it was 2000. And they, it's been re republished since then. Okay, so the, the, the idea was that entanglement uh, shows us that there's no time no space. Um, say a word about that. And you, in the book, you say that this is the most momentous ex discovery in the history of science. That's really something to say. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I, I still believe it's a novel colony. It's too bad that John Bell uh, died early, because he certainly, in my mind, he deserved the Nobel Prize. John S. Bell should have gotten the Nobel Prize. The EPR paradox that Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen brought up. Um, actually, John Bell um, answered it, but he died early, and he, uh, he should have gotten Nobel Prize because it is uh, the most momentous uh, physics uh, understanding of the universe today. Why do you say that? No locality. The universe is no local. So why is that the most momentous discovery? More than because, gravity. Because we, because we think we think of the universe as made up of objects, but if it's if it's not local, then objects is an idea in the mind. It's not reality. So this is really where I believe the wrong mind can be can uh, hold us back because we believe that um, we are something less than we really are. Um, so. When I went to school, I had the idea that an atom is these little balls rotating about a, around a nucleus that's kind of like a ball. But now we know that the, the parts of an atom are um, potential vibratory vortexes. They don't exactly exist. In a, yeah, they don't exist. They kind of, they, there are more waves, wave-like, wave -like. and the question is, what are the waves? And this is the staggering uh, fact of, uh, and actually that's where Nolan Cotton comes from, the staggering fact of quantum physics is that there are waves of probability. <laughs> you know, in other words, they're in the mind. <laughs> the particles, in the end of the day, they're in the mind. So this is not, they're not hard little uh, spheres that go around like the Earth goes around the Sun. They're waves. But when you measure them, they become localized. So when, when I'm looking at you, I know intellectually that 99% of you is empty. And it's, it's all this vibrating potentiality. But why is it that I, can, I could poke your shoulder and I would feel solid? So it's not 99, it's 99.99999%. But whatever, it's, it, most of, of our bodies is empty space. The reason is because of electromagnetic interaction. Because of electricity, electromagnetic, because of atomic forces, you know, basically, you know, you poke, you cannot go through my skin if you poke me because there is resistance from uh, chemical uh, bonds, chemical, uh, chemical forces. Of course, there is, there is some healing, and this is interesting to explore. There are some healers who can actually, my understanding is, they can go through your skin <laughs> without, without. Um, you know, operation, you know, so maybe... Barbara Brennan I'll, I'll, said she could do that with her, her guides would go through her fingers and do psychic surgery on change right. organs. So, but of course this is considered rule of science, if you say that, people say, wow, that's ridiculous, and this, uh, you, you, then what happens to the American Medical Association. So we have to be careful, of course, because, you know, we are also scientists, but at the end of the day, the, the body is not solid, it is uh, fluid, at least, at least it's fluid, if not more than that. Yeah, well, placebo, 
you know, it's what's interesting to me, placebo has been like an irritant to the medical profession and the drug manufacturers and researchers, but they should say, whoa, placebo is 40% as effective. Why don't I understand, why don't I learn how to harness that? Then we wouldn't need to use these pills with side effects. Right. I mean, it's for some, some pills, the placebo works better than the pill. <laughs> yeah. So, might as well take a placebo. <laughs> right. And, and the, the, the professor at Harvard is doing research that even if, if I tell you it's placebo, and I say, but this is, this is a sugar pill, but it's helped other people, it, then it's also effective, even if I know it's placebo. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. Now, on the other hand, we don't want to throw uh, the great advances of uh, Western medicine either because it's doing phenomenal work, right? So again, you have to have a balanced approach. Not, don't go overboard one way or the other. But certainly, you know, sometimes, as we said, uh, a placebo works even better than a, a chemical that may poison your body. So, well... Well, why do you, you know, think that is? Why, why does my mind thinking, oh, this big red pill is going to help me, why does it change, like, my pain level or whatever it is, the problem, the, my migraine, whatever the problem is? Because the universe is mental. The universe is mental. It needs some nation. The universe is conscious. That's why. So your, your belief operates on the basic strata, the basic substance of the universe? Yes. Now, you may one may say, why not believe in well, sometimes believing to get well, why it doesn't work? And you have to have an operation. And I, I wouldn't advise people not to have an operation. I had an operation myself. <laughs> you know. Again, use common sense. It's because perhaps there's more than meets the eye. Okay. And um, one rule doesn't really apply to every that's why those again those three laws of the universe are so important because they give you a way for consciousness to give rise to the universe, but would not put absolute rules. Then, whenever we try to make absolute rules, then we go astray, so to speak. So, I think you could want to heal himself or herself, but maybe sometimes there are deep ingrained conditions, and they become from some people would say come from karma or past lives or whatever. I don't know that maybe are ingrained in our in our inner psyche, and you cannot do it by just cold, or it requires a lot of meditation. In that case, you should have an operation. <laughs> yeah, what, that made me think of Ian Stevenson found that a lot of children have birthmarks that represent the way they were killed in a previous life. And so if it can even imprint on the physical body, then it certainly implies that we carry an imprints in our emotional bodies. Exactly. The emotional body is way more, um, is much stronger than the physical body. You know, in fact, actually, there is a continuum between the physical and the emotional and the and the noetic. There's not, it's not okay. My mind starts here and ends here, or my my emotional body starts here and ends there, or the physical, for that matter, the physical body. The physical body is more obvious because you have the epidermis. You know, you have the, the physical body, but in fact, we know that. When we dream, our body expands beyond the physical body. Like in astral travel, like Robert Monroe? Exactly. Do you, do you think, what, what do you think will happen when you die, to you? So, um, um, people are always ask the question, and in fact, one of the eight, uh, one of the eight rules is, uh, number seven is, uh, one day we're going to die. So I say, remember, remember your own death. What, and now I, I say, remember your own birth. The real question is, where did you come from? If you know where you came from, then you know where you're going to end, where you're going. In fact, we know from Tibetan Buddhism, and we know from uh, some of the uh, Hindu traditions, and they tell us quite um, in clear scientific sense, quote unquote scientific in terms of traditions, what happens when uh, one leaves the body behind. Like the the Book of the Dead, going through the bardo, all those different stages. Exactly, exactly. And of course, in the, in the Christian tradition, or in the you know in the, in the religious sense, we we have it that you know a person dies, uh, make the transition, is etc. etc. So it's universal. 
So I'm not so much concerned about that because it's one thing that's 100% sure it will happen. The question is, what happened before? What brought me here? So that's my question. Do you have any um, kind of remembrances of previous lives? Years? Um, to be honest with you, I can say whether they were previous lives or they were emotional, being in an emotional, strong emotional situation where perhaps being in an area where a lot of people are killed, it uh, like certain birds. For example, water you know, when the, uh, uh, it was uh, when I was there, I, I wanted to get out and said, you know, it's, I, well, there were 50,000 people get killed in one day <laughs> at the water you know. With Napoleon. So, Napoleon, yeah. So, um, so that, that enemy is still there. Uh. Uh, so, you know, that's why some spiritual places are easier to go to. And uh, if you go to water, you have to be, you have to get used to it. Now, was I there at the water? I have no idea. But maybe I was picking up this negative energy that was still there. So I cannot answer about previous lives. In fact, uh, as a physicist, I say there's really no way to tell between previous lives and parallel lives. In other words, maybe we are tapping into another parallel universe and we consider it because of the ego, we consider it that it is us having continuity. Um, but then, the, again, some decent traditions and some of the early Christians, they were believed in. Um, Transmigration, so it's interesting to to, to look at and uh, find out. Indeed, that's, that's yeah. the case. And one of Robert Monroe's books, he talks about when he was astral traveling, he visited another part of his psyche who was incarnated in another dimension and went into his body and was inappropriate. So he realized he should never do that again. But he. He, he's interesting because he was not a believer in spirituality, but he just had these experiences. So, um, and then that kind of leads to some people say, well, this could be all virtual. You know, maybe we're in somebody's hologram or virtual yeah. reality. <laughs> yeah, and so, and that of course makes sense if the universe is conscious because then one thing is virtual. <laughs> it's all in the mind. So that's why the, the, the mental is it, in the end of the day. The universe is mental. There was a great uh, teacher, Buddhist um, uh, Zen master, and she was actually a uh, female, uh, self taught. She didn't, she didn't go to college. Uh, uh, her name was Dehang Sunin. Sunin means uh, monk. She was a monk, a uh, Buddhist monk. And um, she was very intuitive. And uh, she uh, talked in, in some of her Dharma talks, as I call, that she was once in Germany. And uh, she all of a sudden, she was. She started feeling all these lost souls, and so she tapped in and said, hey, "What's going on? Where, where are you?" And there were priests and, uh, and nuns that were brutally killed. During, I guess during the religious wars between the Catholics and the Protestants, and they were stuck in this place in Germany. And they asked her, her "Said, you know, we're stuck here." And she said, "Go." <laughs> Why are, you stuck? Why are you stuck here? Go, just go. And she describes how she, she told just go, just go. <laughs> Move on. Move on. And they moved. She said, it was amazing. They, they left. said, oh my God, yeah, we can go. When and they were stuck. They were stuck there. Yeah. It was, is she a, a Korean contemporary nun? Or yeah. When? yeah. Yeah. She's still living? Yeah, oh, she passed away. Hmm. She passed away. But in, she was completely uh, soft dog. Ah. Um, could in in terms of the conscious universe, could you explain again what complementary complementarity means in terms of Bell's theorem? So complementarity is the way particle aspect. So um, in terms of Bell's theorem, uh, the reason that uh, there is this um, entanglement is because the basic wave nature of quanta. So when you make a measurement, then it shows up as a particle. But in fact, it is the wave aspect that connects them together. So that's, this is, again, going back to the hard problem or the easy problem. This is actually an easy problem <laughs> if you consider it as waves. Otherwise, it's an impossible problem. 
So how do these these entangled particles, photons or electrons or whatever they are, I how do they they seem to communicate, but someone said, well, you know, you can't say they communicate. What, what is the mechanism by which they stay, they respond to each other? I, in some of the, our recent papers, we say it is information. It's information field that we have to bring information. They're communicating in, through non-space-time. Not space-time, but non-space-time. And that's an information field. Do they Outside. communicate with waves, or is it something totally different? It's, they communicate instantaneously, because information is instantaneous. So this is why the universe is mind-like. But what does information field mean? Is, does it have a, can it be measured? Does it have any kind of properties to it? Or is it just like an invisible, I think they call it a vacuum, that somehow magically conveys information? Well, it's, the magic part is that it's more local, but it's not magic, because the universe is more local. So there's no magic. It's, um, and this is, of course, what d -Ray has been trying to say. Um, so it's not magic, but uh, you can call it magic if you follow a Cartesian universe, and it's very magical and it makes no sense, and then reject it. But actually, it's not magical. Um, so it is information, because information in comes from two words, in formation. <laughs> you know, we should listen to our own words. So it is um, intelligence or information means that you can make uh, sense of random chaos from orderly, order information. And this is what the human mind does very well. That's why we have computers, etc., etc. So the universe is informational in nature or conscious. But like we can, we can measure our brain waves, and we have alpha, beta, theta, delta. But is there right. any kind of measurement of the information field? So when these particles communicate, they are maybe communicating through the information field. In other words, which is which is more foundational. It's not so it takes away the idea of consciousness or self-conscious or, or self-aware as a human being. Because whenever we're talking about consciousness, we get in trouble because we think of human consciousness. But if it's information, it is at the more fundamental level. So it, I think the universe is informational. Or mind-like, mind-like, in the sense of a cosmic mind, not in the sense of a human mind. So it doesn't, yet, it doesn't have anything that could be measured? The entire thing is, is does not measurement. The entire universe is the observer. And observer means information. So it's, it's an awareness, but it's not anything... It's, fundam it's fundamental awareness, exactly. It's not intangible. It's the potential, first of all, in this they call it um, triadic system. So it has being, existence, you cannot prove existence. Existence is existence. You cannot prove it. Second is the ability to know itself, consciousness. And the third one is ability to create everything. It's called Ananda or love. That's the power of the power of the mother. So these are the three criteria of the universal consciousness. Be existence, uh, ability to know, and ability to create infinity of universes. Um, part of this is our concept of time as linear, chronological, we know isn't true. Because if you, in Dean Radin's experiments or the remote viewers, the remote viewers could view a target that wasn't even selected. Exactly. So that means that time isn't linear. Time is not Time, if anything, time is cyclical. That's mind blowing, really. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're so used to thinking time is linear. That's because we, we have a linear mind. <laughs> 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 but you, then you have to look at it, it's linear only in terms of where it is on the circle. <laughs> if exactly. you take this part of the circle, it's linear, but really it's exactly. a circle. <laughs> exactly. actually, actually, it's more general than that. I think it's spiral. A spiral, yeah. Uh, I, did a, a, I just did a book for kids about 
answers to kids deep questions in photographs and for the question is what is God I show different photographs of spirals galaxies rows nautilus shell this is like this is like a law exactly right exactly right this is like a law okay um, all right let's let's keep, keep going with your books I know we're yeah um, okay uh, you, have to wrap it, probably have to wrap it up pretty soon uh, you are the universe discovering your cosmic self and why it matters. Published in twenty seventeen. What what is that about? Basically, we ask uh, fundamental questions about the universe and uh, with Deepak Chopra, and in a way, we come up that there's more questions than answers. <laughs> Which actually, I think, it's very exciting because it will keep us scientists going for many years. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. So what does yeah, that mean, you are the universe? Basically, you are, the universe means uh, you are universal questions, we are universal questions. In other words, the separation between the object and the subject is an apparent separation, it's not real. Um, so we are what we observe. Um, why do you think that the world is in such a bad state that we have, you know, Bolsonaro and Trump and the leader in Hungary and the Philippines, that we have more of these autocrats being elected and climate change is destroying the planet and there's growing inequality? What, if we're part of this universal consciousness, why are we so corrupt? Because um, of linear thinking. Because we... Because we we want to dominate each other, and in dominating each other, we probably kill each other. This is the history, this is the lesson from history. We have not the lesson from history. We keep repeating the same things again and again and again, which is fine. Maybe someday we'll learn. But my concern now is that we are at the stage where we can uh, self destroy ourselves. So when I, I talk to young people, is look, don't. Don't look at us. We made a big mess out of it. <laughs> We've grown up to make They would mess. agree. They've got that. Uh, you have to clean up the mess, so to speak. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so, do you have hope or do you not have hope in terms of our future survival? Uh, absolute hope, yes. I'm a, I'm a hopeful guy, yes. Because <laughs> Why? Because, because the universe is conscious. <laughs> and also because life is everyone in the universe. So, if we fail here, well, it will be picked up somewhere else. There is, uh, you know, there is one followed by 20 to 0 uh, Earth like planets in the universe. One followed by 20 to 0. So, you know, planets are very common. So, if Earth does make it, I think life is going to continue going, going on Earth. But, but Colin Einstein, um, about the, you know, he said, well, I don't know about the, uh, World War Three, but I can tell you, World War Four, uh, World War Four is going to be fought with sticks and knives. That's mm. what Einstein's. Mm. You know, I don't know about World War Three, mm. but I can tell you, about World War Four is going to be with sticks and knives. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. Just so a few we, more, few more questions. What, what's yeah. your next book? Where, what are you researching now? You've been doing a lot of work about climate change. So we publish mostly we publish in that, and we do some work on, uh, on natural hazards, and uh, we may do, we do a book about that. But my current book, which is translated in Greek, and next is going to be translated back into English because I the region in English, but I am looking for a publisher. It's called Reality. It's called Science, Reality, and Everyday Life, and that's what um, I'm a sole author, author of that. What's it about? What's what is it saying that you haven't said? It's exactly what, what the title says. Science, what the quantum mechanics says. Reality, which is metaphysics or philosophy, and everyday life, which is the the eight the eight principles of saying before. How you apply quantum the quantum mechanics to your everyday life. And the second part, which is the longest one, biggest one, it has to do with philosophy, with perennial philosophy. Non dual traditions. Um what what do you do for fun? You've written over three hundred articles, fifteen books. What what do you do for amusement? Um, I hang around people and we talk. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, and we go to dinner and uh, like everybody else. Uh, yeah, 
and write books. I write a lot of books these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you would like people to think about that we haven't discussed? Don't give up. Do hard work. Don't give up. And remember, you are more than you think you are. So, yeah. Follow, follow your own, your own life. Follow your bliss. <laughs> follow your bliss, and don't listen to what uh, other people tell you. I thought that pretty good young people. <laughs> Except you. Listen, listen to your parents, but don't listen to your parents. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much for doing thank this. I really appreciate.